All right, we're live. So, hello everybody, and thank you for joining us today. Uh, we're currently living in a time of great change that is affecting all industries. And today we are having a conversation in regards to the travel industry and the transition or evolution towards creating more immersive online experiences. Uh, I have a, with us today, uh, Jennifer Fine. She's CEO of Yuli, uh, You Live to Travel group, and I'll just let you go ahead and introduce yourself. Hey, well, good morning. I'm down here in Melbourne, Australia. So it is Wednesday morning for me. And I am the CEO and co-founder of You Live to Travel, uh, which is a company that makes software for organizers of group trips. So we were very, very excited to uh, be kind of splashing out onto the startup scene uh, right before the, the COVID-19 uh, hit us. And so it's obviously an awkward time to be a uh, travel software company. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, but, uh, you know, one of my favorite things that kind of came out of it was the fact that I got to meet you through all of this. And so, yeah, so I'm, I, I am actually, um, just like everybody else, I'm going through this process of like figuring out how to be more virtual and be comfortable with that. Totally. Um, but I actually founded the company as a reaction almost to how much we were going online. And uh, it was right around the time that actually Facebook had really doubled down on the whole virtual reality thing. Like they had just like gone all in and they're like, virtual reality is the future. And I was like, no, you know, like I'm going to, I'm going to build software that helps people get offline and nice. get out into the real world and have real experiences and, and actually, um, reconnect with reality instead of disconnect mm -hmm. from reality. So that was sort of one of my founding principles. So it was, it was pretty hard for me when this hit and everyone's like, okay, now everything's virtual. Yeah. <laughs> so now we're trying to use virtual reality to connect to reality. Cause it's hard for us to be in reality. Cause we can't be near each other. <laughs> yeah. Like, Hi. And <laughs> It, well, exactly. And so uh, I actually think I've, I definitely resisted that and still kind of resist it. But uh, the reason why I thought, uh, you know, the reason why we've ended up working together is because you've kind of shown me kind of how to do it right. If that Trying. makes sense. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and I feel like so many people are, you know, trying to figure this out. And, and certainly that's what um, that's what we've been trying to do in, in making our community meetup. So despite the fact that we are a travel company or a software company dedicated to travel, which is dedicated to people kind of going offline, uh, our clients are all over the world. So it doesn't make sense to have physical events with all of our clients. And so instead we've done community meetups and we did that even before all of this. Um, and so, you know, I'd started to kind of dabble in that sort of creating of online space and having conversations, but mm -hmm. um, it's, it, it's not easy. It's not really not natural. And like, even right now, so here I am just trying, trying to figure out um, how to be, Right. And I'm like the camera looking back at me and I'm just feeling really uncomfortable because <laughs> like, oh, is my hair OK? You yeah. know, and it, it, you just get so much more self-conscious online. And one of the things I love about the things that you do is you're just like, OK, welcome. Now turn off your camera. Yeah. Or I forced to turn it off. Yeah. <laughs> that's, one of the, that's one of the big things that I see. It's like, you know, I, even I get like so burnt out of seeing myself interacting constantly. And it's yeah. just, you know, it's not something that you normally get your own feedback, which just feeds back into self-consciousness and makes you less natural when you're on Zoom or when you're on any of these platforms that all just post your, you know, your live picture in front of you. So mm. you know, I, I do sound baths and I do meditations and breath work and stuff like that. And it's more important, the content is more important than the looking at each other or looking at yourself. So yeah, like you said, like in a lot of the events that I do, I have people laying down. I have people wearing headphones. You know, it's not important to watch the screen. I don't, I'm not trying to get more people on more screen time. I'm trying to use mm -hmm. technology to get more people off of screen time. 
which is, you know, kind of a catch 22 in a way, but yeah. it's, it's evolving and I'm getting there. <laughs> Well I, well, I feel like we're kind of the same, trying to use software to, to help people get into real experiences. Mm -hmm. And But what, what's funny for me is that I've tried various kind of meditation classes before in, in the real world. And, uh, and I have never had them have the same impact as yours. Okay. And... <laughs> Yeah. And, you know, and I, I've been trying to figure that out because I'm very, I'm very anti-virtual. So I'm like, um, <laughs> how can this be? And uh, my, my theory is that it's partly personal. And I think it's also, it comes back to that self-awareness thing, which is if I'm in a room, like a physical room with other people, I'm very aware of what they're doing. You know, they're breathing, they're moving, yeah. you know, and I'm aware of the teacher kind of being somewhere, giving me instructions. And there's, more input, like more external input in that real yeah. world. Whereas when I did yours, it was just like, just me in a dark room. And I was actually finally able to kind of properly let myself go into the meditation in a way I'd yeah. never let myself do in, in a room with other people. Yeah. And, and we were talking about this the other day. I mean, there's, you know, there's definite benefits and there's definite difficulties with using this online way of interacting. And one that you're talking about right here is you can access these live events without needing to get outside of the safety or comfort of your own home. You can mm -hmm. be wearing whatever you want. You can be whatever your lighting is. You know, everybody's definition of what a comfortable, safe, open space is slightly different. Um, so you have control over that. So in a way, you know, I'm able to, and, and any practitioner that's doing these things online is able to really get into a special place with their participants that they aren't usually able to access. Um, mm -hmm. And as long as you can get the message across that it is important to have that space created on your end and to put on a set of headphones or to have a nice set of speakers. Um, you know, that, that is a part that I have to let go of control of because the only thing that I can do is say in the event, you know, get your space ready, come on ready, have your headphones, be lying down, have your space set and ready we're going to start, you know, five minutes after the event starts because I'm not going to wait around for that. So the biggest thing that I'm finding is besides a good internet connection on my end and being actually wired in to get the data out properly, uh, is to get that message across of like, what is the preparation? Um, and that's something mm -hmm. that I've found through Yuli and your program is that it's actually a little bit easier to get people to have those reminders, like have a few days, have that reminder go out, you know, have that, get that ready, make sure you review the, the guidebook or whatever it is. That's super helpful on my end as a practitioner for getting people prepared for the best possible experience. Mm. Well, and I, I think that's, um, that's one of the things that we've always really believed in is. You know, if you're going to go into any kind of experience that's going to change you, you, you kind of have to be ready for it. Mm -hmm. And ready means different things for different kinds of experiences. But if you're not, if you're not in the right mindset, like you haven't set your intention, which is one of the things I love yeah. that you do. Um, so you're not just kind of like, ah, I don't know, I'm just here. It's like, <laughs> no, well, what you, you get out of these things, what you put into them. And I, and I guess that's kind of, you know, the, the takeaway for me in, in terms of being forced to appreciate virtual experiences yeah. uh, is that you, you get out of them what you put into them. And so virtual experiences can be transformational. They can be really life affirming, uh, but only if the creators have the intention to make that space. Mm -hmm. And then only if the participants are capable of uh being prepared for them. And I think what, for me, the thing that's hard is like, we don't have instincts or at least our generation, I, you know, who knows about the sort of younger generations. We don't have the same instincts about what it means to um, be as engaged in these virtual spaces. Like 
you know, we have all these social cues and all these kinds of ideas that just we're, we learn instinctively about how to interact with humans and how to um, respond to people being in space and all these kinds of things. And then you put us online and we're just like, <laughs> and so I feel like the whole... <laughs> yeah, exactly. Like, <laughs> Oh, virtual backgrounds. They're the bane of my existence. I don't know why I apparently look more like a background than my background does. And so oh, I become blank you out. Yeah, like oh. I move around and I, I'm the virtual background. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's too funny. Yeah, and, and so that that's one of the the interesting things about what I'm creating. It's like I'm I'm not particularly, th th there is a place for interaction between the participants in what I'm doing, but I'm, my intention is to create space for each individual to connect with themselves. Mm -hmm. So I'm not, I'm not really coming in to have a discussion with people. I'm, I'm creating an hour long time period for you to gift to yourself, to be with you and what's there for you. And that's why I can have, you know, whatever, a hundred people on there. And each person has a completely different experience based off of where they are at. And by turning off the cameras, number one, that gives me much better data quality to send over high quality sound. And then when people are using Wi-Fi on that end, they can actually get the sound properly. Um, but two, that that limits the external inputs and distractions. So as long as they don't mm -hmm. have like a hundred other tabs up or whatever, I mean, that's why I'm like, go put on your headphones, go lay down. You're not looking at your phone. Yeah. You're not looking at anything. I'm here yeah. with you, giving you the opportunity to take the time for yourself. Yeah. And, that, and I that's, think that's, that's, kind of the difference. that's why, that's why this is, this definitely works for, yeah. for what you do. And I think what's fascinating about this time is that lots of people are trying and, and seeing like, can they take what they do and make a virtual version that is good in, you know, by whatever definition. And I, I think what we've found is that um, on the travel side of things, a lot of people have found that it's like, it's okay. Like, mm -hmm. you know, it's fun to kind of like watch the zookeepers feed the koalas and, <laughs> you know, and, and that kind of thing. But it, ultimately it's, it's only, it's the kind of thing that as soon as you can go and see those koalas on your own, you're going to go. Yeah. You're because, like, I'm gone. <laughs> yeah. Like as soon as that's an option, then this is not nearly as interesting. And so I think for the travel industry, the sort of virtual um, exercise has been to tide us over to keep people attached to destinations and experiences and just to kind of entertain them while they're sort of trapped inside mm -hmm. um, and that that's been my experience but I think there are some things that like like meditation and some other kinds of um, you know virtual retreats and things like that where I think mm -hmm. people have actually really figured out how to make a virtual experience that is is a quality experience that you might actually seek out even if you can leave your house totally and, and i think it's that just I think it's convenience cool. of it and and with those things it's like you know there there is there's two different things so in the travel world i see emerging of the virtual side because what i what i kind of think is going to happen if not already is happening is that people are going to offer more virtual recording and the ability for people to pop into a trip or experience a part of a trip with video mm -hmm. and technology as a foot in the door to get more people traveling yeah. you know, so, some people will have that itch scratched by just sitting there and watching the video other people will go oh my gosh like what would this be like to actually be in this other country? Mm -hmm. And this other culture is so crazy. Like I, you know, I've never experienced anything like that. What's that like firsthand in person? So, mm -hmm. you know, I, I see, and this is already happening. I mean, uh, what's his name? Josh down on the Amazon's like posting more pictures of his tribe down there and getting more of it out online. And I think that that can be a really attractive thing for people and seeing videos of people's experiences and seeing maybe a live stream from somewhere really, really cool. 
Like we can mm -hmm. do that from while we're traveling. And that can be great advertisement through Facebook Live, through YouTube Live, through Instagram, whatever you want to do it. As long as it doesn't get in the way of your experience of that, it's like there's a there's got to be a balance there too, right? It's like don't constantly stream what you're doing because then you're not really there. But if you have yeah. one day on a month, you know, whatever, 10 day trip that you mm. take some time to like live stream or something that mm -hmm. can be a really great way to get more people interested. And then, on, yeah, but, oh, go ahead. I was gonna say, it's such a skill though. And I oh, think totally. it, it's not something like that I've even, I've suggested to various clients of ours in terms of, you know, ways to kind of get their brand out there because they often launch on our platform. Mm -hmm. um, and while we don't do the marketing side of it, you know, we kind of give people some tips and, one of those is, you know, make sure that you're putting videos out of your guides. Like, this is the reason people, you know, go to Bhutan is like to go hang out with these really interesting guides, right? Yeah. And and yet it's like they've tried to put cameras on them and they just kind of, Ugh. you know, they <laughs> they stop yeah. being real as soon as the camera comes on them. So, um, you know, I guess in a way this kind of makes the point that you, you kind of have to just go, but um you know I i'm fascinated to see what kind of content like you were just saying is going to suddenly um it, like people will have learned to kind of do a little bit of virtual stuff while they're in lockdown and will they then take one of the days out of the 14 to be like okay we're going to do a live stream and here's something and they just they know how that works and so it doesn't right. disrupt their flow whereas before they would have been super stressed out and like i don't know and it never works and it's like oh, i've been doing this for months you know <laughs> like yeah, I'll yeah. Just, let's just do a quick one and mm -hmm. and that might actually really change that i'm seeing a comment from delphine new technology disconnects people with the real experience you know i, I that's one of my opinions when I'm traveling. I actually don't take a lot of videos or pictures mm -hmm. when I travel. And like when I when I climbed Kilimanjaro, I specifically left all my cameras and devices in, in the hotel. Nice. Yeah, yeah. I mean, first of all, I knew that like everybody else in the group had one and I was like, all right, well, <laughs> there will be photos. And I just thought, I wanna be this, I will never do this again. Mm -hmm. I wanna be a hundred percent present and I don't wanna be looking at it through through a device because like I can watch documentaries about Kilimanjaro, right? Like totally. I can do that and, and they'll be so much better than anything I could ever take. But um, so, but it was a, it was like a hard choice. You know, I feel like we, <laughs> we get very like addicted to our devices and stuff. Oh, for and, sure. You're like, Oh, yeah. I want to be able to remember this afterwards or share it with my family or whatever it is. I mean, I, you know, I, I agree with that statement in a lot of different ways, but it all depends on what your intention is you can use technology to further connect people with real experiences. You can use technology to provide a platform on which people then actually have interest in going and having new experiences. Mm. Um, there, there are so many people that just don't know these things exist or don't have a reason to be enticed to do them because they haven't seen anything that gives them a good idea of what it's like. So as long as we are intentionally using the technology it's okay but the second you find yourself scrolling through facebook for an hour and a half and you're 25 tabs later and you've watched 1500 new videos for no reason and you don't even know where you are anymore i mean yeah you're totally yeah. disconnected and you don't even know what or where you are or who you are or what you're doing so yeah. it's it's a it's definitely a difficult back and forth to be able to properly intentionally use technology to connect people and, and you have to know what you're doing <laughs> yeah and and i do think um it, it's a skill right and, totally. and learning how and and i don't know if what comes out of this period is that people just are that much more addicted to the virtual and the the scrolling and everything or if uh, my dream is that there will be um, a massive desire to just get out. And, you know, even today, you know, we have a light lockdown, like we have to stay in our communities, but the parks are just packed because, yeah. you know, people are like so sick of being inside. Whereas those people might've just been sitting in 
scrolling through Facebook in the morning and now they're out at the park. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I'm hopeful that that is going to kind of play through and people are going to, you know, as things start lifting, they're going to start getting out more and more and more. But uh, one of the things that I always hated when traveling, especially when I did it myself, but, you know, you get onto the bus after the experience and the first thing everybody does is like find the Wi-Fi, get onto the phone, you know, instead of just kind of being present and processing the experiences that you just had and talking to each other. Yeah. Uh, and, and that's something I think uh, a lot of the clients that we have, they, um, they try to create spaces where there's sort of social pressure not to do that, like on mm-hmm. the trips. And so, you know, you're, you're kind of encouraged to interact with the other humans that are there and kind of, I think one of our clients actually has a sort of no device policy nice. for the two weeks. So you're just, you know, sort of off offline for the two weeks and just yeah, it's full immersion. You, yeah. yeah. Um, one of my favorite um, ones, um, a woman named Antiza, um, she does coaching experiences. And one of my favorite stories she told me is she just told the client, meet me in Mongolia and, and plan to be, uh, plan to be there for two weeks. <laughs> and like maybe with a, like a packing list and stuff like that. And that's I it. And, that. it's like, yeah. and then they had to show up and just like, you know, come into that and just trust that this was going to be the right thing or, you know, it was going to, it was going to be an experience. And, yeah. you know, it's one of these days I'm going to be gutsy enough to actually sign up for something like that. That sounds right? amazing. I want to go do that now. <laughs> <laughs> But that requires a huge, like talking about making space, like the person organizing that has to know enough to take on all that responsibility, right? And they have to create um, a a schedule and, um, you know, handle the contingencies of, you know, people come in and sure they, they think they're up for this adventure. What if it turns out they're not up for that particular adventure, right? And so just kind of like managing through all of that real world stuff, um, it, it's a huge amount of responsibility for the, the organizer. Totally. And, 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 and preparation I, of the people attending it as well. I mean, mm-hmm. it's like when I did a month in Nepal and did the Monosoly circuit and, you know, the very, the very beginning from the very start of the entire thing, you know, months, six months before we actually left, he's like, you have to be flexible. You have to be open to the unknown happening. All of these things. Day yeah. three of our 23, 25, no, 20, what was it? 24 day trek. Our trek leader got really, really sick and got airlifted out on day three. Oh, no. And then the entire experience ended up, it was, it was amazing, but it was, like every at every turn, there was something that ran. You know, I got sick. My other friend got sick. We were all like high fevers and everything. We finally got through that part. Ended up going up into the area to go see. Uh, oh gosh, what was it called? Now I'm gonna forget. Um, in the Manasu Valley. Uh, anyways, the, up up into the further areas, and it kept on being that this is the first year ever that during that period of time the pass was was still completely snowed in, and we were not able to do the full trek so we had to end up making a decision to either try and then have no way to make it back to our airplane or and and, or get stuck and die in the snow because some people got hit by an avalanche the day before us going up into the same spot we were about to go up into and so we had to at the last minute make the decision to just turn around and go all the way back the way we came and you know so it was, he did a really good job of preparing us and being like, Hey, if you are not a person that can be flexible and work with schedules that end up not being schedules, do not Mm. come on this trip. Mm. Like, do not just, I'll give you your money back. Do not come like, don't even sign up. And so, you know, it's so much for setting intention for any type of experience that creates it. Right. And Mm -hmm. And the more you can get people to understand that, and it doesn't take that much time, but the more emphasis you can put on coming in and creating a context for the situation, 
creating an intention for the situation, going through it, and then afterwards having some reflection on what just happened, you know, that's yeah. where the real transformation comes from. And you can have that traveling, you can have that online. It doesn't matter what your way of interacting is. Uh, it just matters how you go into it and how you go out of it. <laughs> yeah, and I think the, the organizer, learn. the organizer yeah. is key to that, right? Because their intention then kind of trickles through. And actually, so the, the point about reflection, so we've gotten a request from a number of clients to make it possible to do journaling as part of our software so that at oh, the end cool. of the day, because often they have these like really intense kind of either cultural experiences or personal experiences or um, whatever it is for that schedule. And exactly what you say, you need that time to reflect on, on that and, and internalize that. And I really struggled because <laughs> my reaction was give them a notebook, yeah. you know, <laughs> like, <laughs> That's what I was thinking too in my head. I'm like, a journal? Like, get a get get a, a physical journal to write in. Anyways, <laughs> yeah, and yeah. and so, but then because my sense of it was like, if you get them back on their phones, even if okay. it's like, okay, we want you to go to the phone and we want to open this app, but you know that the phone is like, if it's on a network, it's immediately pinging you about something else that you haven't been paying attention to, and it just brings your stress level right up yeah. even if your intention even if you like how many times have you gone to your phone with the intention of doing one specific thing and then 10 minutes later you're like what did i why did i pick my phone <laughs> you haven't even done what you, you know, wanted you to do <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> and so you know this is so my challenge is being a software company so we make software and software runs on devices with screens and um, so trying to be responsible and kind of balance that, uh, like, okay, well, should we make it so that, well, and so in the end, what we did is we made a, um, an offline app so that oh, you can nice. still, you can still activate it. So like tell them, do not activate your network, um, but go into the app. And so that, that's been, you know, that's kind of our, that was our compromise. Yeah, yeah. Because I still like a regular course, journal better. <laughs> well, okay, but so speaking of things that are that have advantages in the online world, so one of the right. things that's nice about doing it within within the Yuli app is that the organizer can actually see that information. Ah, uh, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. And so it's a way for them to support you through that process. And, um, and you, can, you can choose to say, you know, I'd be happy for this to be shared with other people. And so it can kind of go through the organizer and kind of come back into the group. And so it just allows the facilitator to not be like, uh, excuse me, can I like read your private journal? You know, like it's, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, it's, you know, cause of course you can, if it's really private that you can still just sort of do it in your own journal. Um, but assuming you're happy to share it with the facilitator, then, um, so, so that's the thing, right? It's like, there's always this double edged thing about technology. Like it, totally. it allows you to connect more, um, you know, and we were kind of talking about this before around, um, you know, getting people to kind of share uh, or be more open. And for you, mm. was it that it's easier in person or is it easier through these virtual meditation sessions to get people to open up? That's a good question. Um, I think it's pretty much difficult all the time. <laughs> I don't think it makes it any easier to do it online, particularly. Um, I have, I want to use the breakout group sessions in zoom to get more conversation around that. Cause I feel like it's easier to get people to converse in smaller groups than it mm -hmm. is with the entire, like, you know, however many people are on your session. But, you know, again, even, even with that, no matter where you are, I think it takes a little bit of the, of the practitioner to go in and remind people that vulnerable discussion is what helps to create community understanding and more transformation. So by jumping, you know, taking, taking that leap and sharing your experience and sharing your, uh, you know, whatever your deep feelings were that came up or a, a vision that you had or whatever that is until we can start connecting on a level that's beyond what is comfortable for ourselves. Mm -hmm we're not going to expand. 
And by being uncomfortable in our sharing, we can actually take a step forward in ourselves and, and step into that discomfort and create comfort there. So, you know, that, that's to me what sharing vulnerably is all about. It is about creating a connection with another person on a new level or with a new community on a new level. And we're so used to talking about the weather or talking about whatever, all the other, uh, yeah, all the other stuff that we, you know, doesn't make any particular difference. And, you know, what I, what I want to do is instigate more of that sharing of the quote unquote spiritual or the, the things that we think we experience that we think other people might not understand or that we think will disconnect us from other people. That is really what will end up connecting us to other people by taking mm -hmm. that step into the discomfort of sharing the things that we think may actually disconnect. Cause then we can mm -hmm. have a conversation about that. And everybody most likely has experienced something similar to that. They were just also afraid of talking about it. So if we can start yeah. talking about that stuff. We can all expand whether or not we're in person. It doesn't matter. Yeah. And, and so I think, I think you, you make that space really well. Um, I think, I, I think I still, I think I'm, I, I've like gotten to the point in my life where I'm like, I just have decided that real world experiences are my, <laughs> are my channel in a sense. I want to do both. <laughs> uh, you know, cause I, and maybe it's just because, I, well, yeah, and you should. And, and that's, I think, I think that's, what's really great about this is, is people discovering that skill of being able to do do that kind of work online as well um and and for me it, it's just it, it's almost like cheating when you're offline because it's like you can make people do a hard physical thing together and that actually like makes it more likely that they'll be um connecting with each other right like it's just totally. this sort of basic human psychology you know you you climb a hard trail together like you you just bond you know just because you've done something physically hard together yeah. And, uh, it, and, and so I think that's the kind of like, that's the beauty of, of taking people on those kinds of transformational oh, experiences yeah. where you challenge them. Um, well, it's like, but I, for, I, hmm. I was gonna say, for example, I mean, that's why I'm becoming a Wim Hof instructor. I mean, I can go take people and have them do a half an hour of deep breathing and get them into emotional releases, have them really oxygenate their body and do something really good for their cardiovascular system and then have them all jump into an ice bath together. I mean, that right there is you're interacting with forces of nature. You're interacting with each other. If you do meditations and exercises together, I mean, there's, there's no, yet there is no replacement for that in-person group activity. To me, mm -hmm. I get much more out of bringing people together in person and lead them in the breath and be able to see their bodies moving and be able to coach them when they're getting uh, their muscles all tightened up or they're getting into a space of tension and being able to really hold that space for them both spiritually, physically, mentally. And that is, you know, it's a whole new, it's a whole nother dimension. And, and, and that's never going to go away as one of my passions. I would much rather, um, it's not even that I would much rather it's, it's, I, I can teach 30 people a breathing session in the morning before my Windermere office meeting for 20 minutes before we do our zoom meeting and talk about real estate and listings. That's just, it's a, it's a new access point where I can make a difference in people's lives that I didn't have before. Mm -hmm. There's, there's something to be said about that. And again, it's what are you using the technology for? What is your purpose of your connection? What do people feel like after that experience? And if I can take 15 or 20 minutes and do three rounds of breathing with people and have them afterwards start messaging me privately going, oh my gosh, I feel so great. I'm clear and focused and calm and energized all at the same time. And then they go into their day. I'm like yeah. that right there is a full new open of impact that can be made. Mm -hmm. 
that being said, yeah. I don't I don't want to only do that. I want the physical in person access as well because with that I feel like you can go even deeper. Yeah. But I see just huge opportunity in in all of that and all of this technology. I mean, before this quarantine, I wasn't having conversations like this on Facebook Live with people. Yeah. <laughs> I've done 18, 19 quarantine sound sessions playing the handpan and just putting music out there. I mean, it's it it forced me to adapt because I'm a person that loves to connect with people. And I wasn't able to do that physically. Okay, so what avenues do I have? Mm. Yeah, but, it's it's neat. It's I I agree. I think it's it's a it's a fascinating development, and um, you know, I think I think good things will come on the other side of this. Uh, but it's it's sort of like it's like a forest fire, right? It's sort of totally you know, a whole bunch of old stuff has has been sort of damaged. And what are we going to grow in its yeah. place? And, and so, and mind you, it's not like I also haven't gotten completely burnt out of doing it. Because two weeks ago, <laughs> I did three, three hour to hour and a half long sessions, plus an interview, plus a breath work session. And then I just was like, oh my gosh, okay, I need a week off. So I took all of last week off. And I yeah. did my other job and you know, real estate and stuff like that. And, and I mean, we had conversations about where at the beginning, you know, everybody was like, oh, how much Zoom can I do? Where can I be? How many places can I be online and connect with people? And then we went through a couple of weeks, like five, six weeks in, where it was like people were just not showing up to Zoom anymore. People were, mm. it seemed to me like people were very burnt out of that yeah. new type of connection. Mm. And, and it's going to be, it's going to be a teeter totter. It's going to be a back and forth of yeah. pushing in and figuring out, okay, okay, how much of this can I actually do? And then, okay, burnt out. Let's, let's back up a little bit. And how can mm -hmm. we manage to create a balance between really intentionally using technology and then intentionally using in-person interactions and, and those things when, when those are, are back. <laughs> yeah. Which is coming. I'm, yes. I'm very excited because I, I think uh, we're we're starting to make plans and we're starting to think about getting back out into the world. So, uh, but I I think I think I I expect you to be continuing to do these online experiences even if it isn't as frequently. Um, and I am grateful that we got to meet because of yeah. this crazy time. Totally. Well, it's been a really real pleasure using your software and seeing how you guys have been evolving as well from doing, you know, longer term trips to kind of scrambling to do something where it's like, oh, we're doing an event in two days. How do we use all of this software to make people more intentional? And how do we do follow ups and things like that? So I'm definitely looking forward to, to using that more uh, upcoming. And uh, I am starting to do monthly on the third Thursday at 8 p.m. PST, uh, a sound breath immersion for the Transformational Travel Council uh, mm. that'll be open as well. And uh, so we definitely would want to, to put that up on the Yuli software sure. and make that a reoccurring one. Um, they're doing a calendar uh, quarterly. So it'll be every three oh. months schedule and then re Easy. rephrase it. So yeah. <laughs> Perfect. I'll be offering more breath work too because that's that's a lot simpler and shorter, and I feel like more people can access like a 20, 30 minute long breathing session in the morning, for example, than an hour uh, long whole session as well, which both have their individual benefits for sure. And then uh, in maybe six months, I'll actually be able to come and and join yes. you in person. <laughs> yes. And maybe we can do like what uh, Delphine was saying over there. Digital detox might be an even bigger trend. I 100% agree with you. I really want to organize, uh, for example, like uh, digital detox dinner parties and just whole events like that you can go to where just don't bring your phone or where mm -hmm. there's a place to like leave your phone when you get to said event, whatever that is, so that people can actually be fully present, like don't bring a camera, don't bring a phone, don't like take your yeah. watch off watch to off. like yeah. whatever, like any of that stuff, just take it all off and let's go like for a hike 
and walk and talk mm -hmm. or a dinner where everybody's eating barbecue or something like that. Like we don't, yes, we, we freaking I'm don't need 10,000 pictures on our phones. Like <laughs> how often do we go back and look at those 50 gigs of photos that we have sitting yeah. there for absolutely no reason that we're never going to go back and look at? Like, yeah, I mean, it's, yeah. it's great to share the stuff on Facebook, but like, oh man, seriously, just be there. Yeah. Anyways. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Well, this I is the teeter totter, <laughs> right? Yeah, this exactly. is the, like, you know, you do want some shots and then, but then if you spend the whole time getting the perfect Instagram photo of your dinner, then, you know, it's cold by the time you eat it. So, <laughs> you know, when I have a proud moment where I've made the awesome dinner, I take a snap. It is what it is. And then, you know, then dive in. But yeah, yeah. I think, I think this is this is the road that we're on, right? Virtual is not going anywhere, um, and we we have to sort of manage that teeter totter. And I think that's kind of what the facilitators, the organizers, the people creating the spaces is their mm -hmm. responsibility to help people come in with intention and get what get what is good for them out of the technology. And I think totally ironically, we're having this conversation on Facebook, and you know, it has its advantages, but. I think their philosophy is like suck you in and take your soul, um, regardless of whether or not that has a positive effect on you. Yeah. Um, and whereas our software, we try to have the philosophy of come in, get your thing done, and now go have an adventure. You know, mm -hmm. get get off. But um, and and that striking that balance is 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 a, a constant exercise. Totally, yeah. Yeah, I, I, like I foresee in my future, like, you know, weekly breathwork sessions, monthly online sessions, and then monthly digital detox sessions where you get people into, I don't know, some retreat center out in eastern Washington or something like that, where everybody can come leave their phones for a weekend and do yeah. sound bath meditations and breath work and survival skills and, and whatever we can do to get people reconnected back into nature. So that's yeah. like, you know, you have, a, you have to have that back and forth. I feel like to, to continue to make the biggest difference, you kind of have to have your foot in, in both a little bit, yeah. uh, at least from like a practitioner viewpoint, um, and use tools that are in, you know, both sides. So yeah, anyways, well, I, 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 I there's a, a one of our new clients is uh, desert Island survival and they take awesome. people to, to desert islands and then teach them how to, um, uh, teach them how to survive on a desert island. And yeah. so of course, uh, without your phones, but of course, to get them prepared and to get them there, uh, he uses a lot of technology. And, yeah. and so that is, it is that kind of interesting, uh, kind of use it to a point and then, then disconnect, have that experience and then come back and kind of learning, learning how to not be maybe quite so dependent on it. Cause I think that's yeah. when it really gets destructive is like um, when you can't cope without it. Um, but if, yeah. you, if it's a tool, you know, and you're in control of your use of it, then technology is amazing. But when don't it's a wake tool up in the morning you, and look at your Facebook feed and your emails and your voicemails <laughs> and your stuff, like take a couple hours for yourself to read and meditate and exercise and eat good food and mm -hmm. then like you know do some affirmations whatever those are for you to get yourself to recreate yourself in the morning so that you can intentionally use technology instead of waking up being in bed grabbing your phone looking at all of the things that you have and then right there you're just carried away on technology for the rest yeah. of the day. And, and then you end up getting to your end of the day and you're like what did i do today <laughs> don't do that don't do that. Well, on that note, it might be time for me to go to enjoy my breakfast. <laughs> yes, please do. I'm going to go for a walk and enjoy this beautiful, sunny, out of nowhere, amazing day and uh, leave my phone inside for a little while. <laughs> <laughs> well, it was really good to chat with you this morning. You as well, Jen. Thank you very much. Enjoy the rest of your day. Uh, I hope that everybody enjoyed this conversation and got some value out of it. Uh, we will 
continue to talk about these things and grow and evolve and uh, looking forward to seeing everybody and Jen looking forward to seeing you in person one of these days at a, at an, at an event. <laughs> Real event. <laughs> <laughs> All right. All right. Until next time, everybody. Um... <laughs>